All right, I'm here with Quayam, also known as Q, the founder of ESG Analytics that recently got acquired for six figures. Q, how are you doing today? I'm pretty good. It's nice to finally get a chance to chat with you, Andrew. Yeah, I love the nickname because I got a last name, Gazdecki, and everybody calls me Gaz, so I'll just call you Q for the, the whole interview. But um, for those that don't know you, do you want to give a quick introduction of yourself? Yeah, I mean, I started my career in finance. Uh, that's kind of what I wanted to do growing up, be a portfolio manager, manage some money, and as a result, I you know went to school for finance, got my CFA, and then half my brain was always like not in the right space because I like technology as well. Uh, and so I was always kind of learning how to code and stuff on the side. But yeah, there's a point in time where the company I was working for got acquired, and I had a chance to start up a company, not ESG Analytics, but it was sort of my first startup, and that kind of got me into the whole startup world. And from there, you know, I did some big four consulting, but then really spent the last like five, six years just building different ventures and startups. And uh, we've been lucky to have a couple of exits now, which in ESH Analytics is, was the first. Um, and so I just consider myself an indie hacker at this point, but I don't know which point we stop being indie hackers and starting <laughs> general hackers uh, all the time. Yeah, 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 you, you stop being an indie hacker when you get customers. <laughs> uh, <laughs> That's true. Um, tell me about... Um... Uh, so you, you've, you've gone through three exits, is that correct? You mentioned yeah, it so, before we started recording, but I said, hey, let's save it for the, the podcast. For sure. Yeah. So basically, ESG Analytics got acquired. Um, the first time we had listed on, on uh, micro, or Acquire, or Micro Acquire at that point, and we ended up getting a buyer off uh, Acquire. And then the second time was on Acquire. But that's the crazy story is that we listed it for sale. Um, we got a buyer who it fit really well with and they brought us on and it was a private equity backed company. And so, you know, we sort of transitioned, you know, the, the team of two, two and a half people basically. And, but what happened was like six months after they, the company went through a few issues themselves. And so the people that brought us on sort of left the company and they gave us the company back for like a dollar. And then we sort of scaled up the business again. And then we resold it on acquire.com to uh, another company who, you know, we're sort of, sort of still working. And in between, I've created a carbon um, carbon marketplace that got uh, acquired as well. So the fortunate set of instances when the market was really good as well. Uh, and so, yeah, that's kind of funding all the new things that we're doing now. That's awesome, man. Buying it back for a dollar. I love it. Yeah. Um, who'd have, well, who'd tell, have thought, you know? Tell me, oh, let's, so for, the, um, for this podcast, let's focus on um, uh, ESG analytics, because um, yeah. I want to know... Um, uh, for just what's like the quick pitch of ESG analytics? What does it do? What problem does it solve? Yeah, um, so it's really meant for investment managers. And so what we're looking to do is use more real-time data to benchmark uh, corporate sustainability and ESG performance, which is environmental, social, and governance. And the issue it's solving is that today, when people are looking to invest in these kind of invest in companies and want to, you know, see how they rate and that kind of stuff. There's all these rating companies, but they use like the reports from the companies, which are like six months to a year old. And so everything you get is like quite lagged. And so we started doing like some NLP, like natural language processing and sentiment analysis to extract all of this data on a day to day basis, map it to all the companies and then deliver it as a an easy to use like SaaS solution and API, which wasn't the case for any other company trying to do that um, at the time. So we were able to get like a better, better portion of the market and make something that look, you know, really, really neat and cool uh, in a business that was kind of purposeful. Interesting. I like that. I like how it's in a market that I'm, I'm not particularly too familiar with. I love businesses like that where you spot something that, yeah, you know, it's, not, it's not like a startup selling to other startups, which ironically, totally. that's all Acquire.com uh, does. Um, but, but tell me about, um, how did you get the idea? What made you, you know, yeah. start this business? What was the light bulb moment? The light bulb moment. It was like a very specific moment. <clears throat> I was looking at like this uh, Bloomberg report and it was like, here are the bottom rated companies from an ESG perspective in the world. So this is basically saying, hey, these are the worst companies, you know, on the planet. And it was by Sustainalytics, which was, you know, sort of the de facto rating agency. And on that list of 10 was like Walmart, Amazon. In my head, I'm like, okay, maybe they're bad companies, quote unquote. I'm like, where is this like the, the bottom 10 in the world? I'm like, there's no way. And we started digging into these rating companies and we found out that, again, they use teams of like 400 analysts to, you know, dig into a company um, reporting documents. And this is not a regulated space. So it's like, you know, they have these 600 page PDF reports, PSR reports once a year. And their coverage was so low. It's like 4,000 companies, 5,000 companies. I'm like, how are people making investment decisions? So uh, that's kind of where we were like, OK, let's uh, why well, I said I say we, but 
where I was like, hey, let's start coding in. Put a slide deck together, showed it to my girlfriend at the time, wife now. And uh, yeah, we started started going going to market and that was in 2020. And uh, the idea as well was to go out with something that because from my finance days, we used to sell to financial advisors and portfolio managers and everyone in the space was selling to like the big enterprise size. I'm like, why shouldn't, why should this data be a hundred thousand dollars a year? It should be 80 bucks a month, right? A hundred bucks a month for anyone trying to look for uh, ESG data. And so that's what we went to market with. I love that. I think we're going to be seeing a lot of that just across um, the whole startup ecosystem with AI tools, making totally. the cost of delivering software, people like you building products um, where it's really, you have a very, um, you're operating the business at a very high margin so you can deliver the product at a lower totally. price. And you totally. don't have to go enterprise, like if you're venture back. Exactly. Yeah. So, so additive, right? Like you add a thousand new customers and all you do is change up your virtual machine from 16 gigs of RAM to 50 and call it a day, right? I love it. When was, um? well, tell me how you got your first customer. I'm interested in that because selling to finance people isn't easy. I've done it before. Yeah. I mean, the first way, if I remember correctly, is just cold LinkedIn outreach and the pitch. So my first startup was in the blockchain space and I really learned a lot of things of like what not to do and how not to build a company. And so with Ishii Analytics, I was really determined to like, you know, talk to people first, engage them as part of the conversation. <clears throat> so leading up, we'd go on LinkedIn and reach out to like, you know, investment relations people or portfolio managers. And we're like, hey, we're building this platform. Would love your feedback. Would love, you know, pay 50 bucks for your time. And um, show at the time, show them a slide deck with some mock-ups. And as it evolves, show them through different things. And that's sort of the core group that became like our first customers. Can I stop you right there and just ask one question? Yeah. So were you selling the product before you actually built it? Were you just showing like designs and mock-ups and basically yeah. the concept? It's almost served as like a double purpose because we're reaching out to people that we thought were our ideal clients, testing them to be our ideal client, and then showing them and getting their feedback on what they think the product is and what things we might be missing. So we're sort of like co-building, but then we can go back to those same people and be like, hey, so we built it. What do you guys think? Yes, right? yes. Good for you, Q. I See, I love the reason I stopped to use I've loved this approach because this is this is how you do it so for those listening you don't have to build a full product to go to market and there's really two questions that you want to have answered before you build the product is who's your ideal customer and does anybody want it you know too many too many founders just build stuff that without talking to anybody first so what you can do is and I actually did this with pretty much every startup I've ever built where I'd show the design like hey this is the concept and kind of get some buy-in from customers and get their feedback, bake it in. And then you start building the product. I'm sure your first version wasn't Oh, yeah. I mean, I have a a really funny story for you on that. So um, the other thing I would always recommend to anyone, like whatever version of your product you put up first, get like Hotjar or UX Cam or whatever whatever monitor like monitors user behavior because the first version we launched did did the thing that we said it was going to do right take a company see the sentiment analysis get a score determine did it look great no right like looked like trash actually in hindsight at the time i was like it's perfect it's done (laughs) um but the one thing i i noticed is like we we added a subscription uh, subscription layer and free trial like immediately and the first home page was like this like you're subscribed right like after you enter your credit card information. And so somebody subscribed and I'm looking at like, I'm looking at like Hotjar and all this person did is like this big, like your subscribe was like the first window and they couldn't like unsubscribe because we hadn't, you know, it was more important to build the subscribe functionality than the unsubscribe. And it's just like this thing. And so you just kind of kept clicking on there because they were met with this payment uh, interface and they didn't even look into the app. And then, so that was like the first thing we're like, okay, people are not even exploring because they're wondering like where their credit card is. And so we fixed that. And then uh, we got the app again. And then we started watching people from there. And it was like, we found that people were going in and like clicking around and they were done with the app in like 60 seconds. So it's like, okay, like how do you make this more engaging and keep people coming back and email alerts and all this kind of stuff. So it was a really interesting trial and error journey, I'd say there, like a lot of lessons learned. Uh, awesome. I, I love Hotjar. Uh, and it's fast. To see what people Amazing. click on. People click yeah, on the weirdest stuff. They'll click on your images. Stuff. They'll click on like tags. Yeah. Um, and it's, it's insight that you just don't get like anywhere else, even if you're talking to people. Like, I, like without it, I really feel like you're flying completely blind, like marketing website and, and otherwise. Yeah. So. It's a great tool to understand how people are using your product without them feeling like, hey, yeah. I, I want your feedback. It's, it's kind of like the natural usage of the product. Totally. You get an idea of what CTAs are standing out. And then in Absolutely. your case, where, where people are getting stuck. Yeah. 
Um, and you asked me about like, you know, the first customers, but one thing we noticed as well, like early in the business, and I wasn't very familiar with like SEO as a concept, like at the early stages, I sort of was diving more into it. But as we were building, you know, we were getting the marketing website up and I was wondering why this website was not ranking on Google. And it turned out it was not server-side rendering at the time. And so anyways, we managed to fix all that. So lesson is definitely keep your marketing website separate from everything else. Um, but we started to understand the SEO game and started to pump out with some really good high quality articles targeting our space. And actually to this date, SEO is the source and has been the source and was the source of 95 plus percent of our leads um, coming in. And so we started to rank, you know, top for like, where did the term ESG come from or Nike ESG and stuff like that. And so that was like, that was the most valuable lesson actually from this entire journey was like the SEO game. I love that. And I love that because especially with, um you know, really specific products, you can dominate the keywords because the competition on them totally. is, is very low. And so if your company has, you know, ESG in the name, you know, that can really benefit you. Yeah. I'm kind of, I'm kind of an SEO nerd too. Um, <laughs> I spent my morning programmatically deploying like 300 SEO optimizers. <laughs> Yeah, but I mean, SEO, it's a, it's the gift that keeps on giving. So essentially, you totally. know, you do this like upfront work and cost, but now your customer acquisition cost is essentially zero because totally. you just have customers and new leads coming to you. So that's awesome. The next question though, um, I love asking this question, but um, did, was there like a time or day or moment when you like kind of sat back and you're like, hey, I, I, I really got something here. I got, I found product market fit. This is, I don't know where this is going to go, but it's working. Yeah, no, true. I mean, you know, in our initial slide deck, I wanted to build to sell, um, but that was theoretical at the time. And as the application started rolling and we saw like this traffic come in and we started to get the assignments from SEO, I'm like, oh, like we really do have something here. And it was primarily self-funded, but with some money from family and friends too. So it was also this very real burn happening, right? at the time. And so just that balance was really interesting uh, to navigate. But, you know, we'd started reaching out maybe like a year and a half, like into the journey for prospective sort of buyers and just, you know, just targeting stuff. Because the thing is, I kind of make this distinction between things that are sexy and make sense from an investment perspective and things that maybe are truly commercial. And I'll classify that the early days of ESG analytics as something that people wanted to get into. It was sexy and it was good from an investment perspective because of the zone. But it's still, even to this day, slightly early from a true commercialization perspective all the way across. So it's additive to the firms that wanted to acquire it, like really strategic. Um, but from a customer perspective, it's not like we had like, you know, a million users or a million customers when it was actually bought both times. That's a great realization in terms of just, or self-reflection in terms of just, you know, where the, the business is. Because yeah. uh, guess what the number one factor of um, really outside startup success is? Go. <laughs> it's timing. Yeah. Oh, absolutely. Like, I'll give you a few examples. Like before YouTube, there was like, 10 different video sites but the problem was um video files yeah. were too big and then adobe flash came out right and then youtube capitalized on that um uber wasn't available until the mobile phone came out yeah uh what's well, another good example um airbnb you yeah. know the, the they tried for you know years totally. but it wasn't totally. until the economic crisis happened that people were a little bit it's more so comfortable true. having people stay in their house for some like, extra income if you don't have the right time in, like you might as well be wrong on your entire idea, like not necessarily, but like, it's true. Like from a, from a true value perspective, it's uh, like, we were lucky that first time that we got required to do it at like a, you know, 22 X like uh, ration was good. Like, you know, mid six figures, like, you know, it was great. And, but you know, today, like it's a little bit different, right? Like with fun and stuff, like, so even just that timing that you go to market and the timing that you exit, it's uh, that that's it's always so bad. You you bring up a great point too. I mean the time at which you exit your business too. So yeah. I always say you want to sell it at the peak, not at the pit. Yeah. So you want to sell when things are going good. Absolutely. And that's really hard for a lot of founders because I have yeah. a lot of conversations that are like, hey, rat, you know, two, three million now, but we're totally going to be at 10 million in a year. Yeah. And that's not guaranteed. And if totally. you have acquisition offers in hand, I another saying I, yep. I always have is treat every acquisition offer as if it's the only one you will ever get yet because it may be and so yeah. um just food for thought there but um let's move on to your acquisition i want to hear i want to hear about how this all went down because yeah um correct me if i'm wrong so you listed on acquire.com uh some other private equity firm bought it but then you yeah. ended up buying it back and then yeah. you listed it on acquire 
acquire.com yeah. again and then found a buyer and totally. sold it that way, right? Yeah. So yeah, exactly. Okay. So, so tell me about um, the second time that you listed where you had the successful acquisition with us. Um, yeah. How did that go? What was the, like, what was your expectations? How many buyers reached out? Um, it was really, this- it, yeah, it was a really interesting process. So first of all, thank God I have my, my, uh, my, my sales co-founder now, uh, Matcha helped me manage this entire process. Uh, so we're sort of like a, a pair team, but okay. So we, we got it back and we had actually reached out to somebody on the acquire, uh, marketplace as well to be like, Hey, like, you know, should we l- look at a broker for this? And the guy, I forget his name, but he was like, I'll help you grow this to like 1 million. Uh, and I'm like, okay, so there's a choice here. Either we can scale it up or we can, you know, list it, but we chose to like sort of do some groundwork, get it all nice spend like, you know, 10 grand on a redesign, all that kind of stuff, and then and then list it. And so we started to get some offers. And one of them actually was somebody who had offered the first time as well, who we'd kept in contact with. And so we started a conversation mm-hmm. with him. And he was a super nice guy and sort of really wanted to, uh, you know, he, he was super interested in this and he had come off an exit himself. And so we started going through um, the, the thing with him. And then that sort of like went here and there. And then we got like, four other like very tangible offers. Um, One was from the guy who we ended up selling to. And then one was somebody who had sort of like a venture firm. So they wanted to come in and do sort of like a, like a, like a carve out in a way, like where we'd sort of work with them, we'd retain a percentage and we sort of all go together and they had some really good B2B like marketing expertise. And that's how their firm operated, which is actually really attractive at the time. Another one was like a Swedish firm who wanted to do, I think it's like 60, 40, um, but then list us uh, to one of their public vehicles on like the Swedish OMX exchange, which is also like an attractive thing and an interesting journey. And so they're like all these like very different uh, sort of things. Uh, and so we actually went quite through with all of them because every time you get an offer, you're like, okay, this is the way we're going, right? Yeah. Because you, you never expect to be in a position, well, not me anyways, and you never expect to be in a position where you're like, you can actually bounce people off each other, like, even though it's not what you intended. And so another buyer came in, <clears throat> was looking to take it over we would sort of help consult with them and they made a cash offer and so now we actually had two cash offers and we really couldn't decide at the time and so we asked we we were pretty transparent and we said like hey just for transparency this is what they offered and then this was the day that it came down to the wire like i'm i'm in i'm in this office my wife's downstairs and i'm like we got an offer for x amount and then i'm like this guy just offered like 20 grand more I went yeah, back to the other guy that. and I'm, he's like he's like okay, I'll match it. And I'm like, it's like 40 grand more. And like, I kept like coming up and down the stairs and I'm like, okay. And then they'll then like close it off. And uh, then I was, we went with them and it turned out to be the best decision because they're really understood our business and it's so additive to what they do. Um, but it was like this sort of like ping ball back and forth. And it was a very cool uh, sort of thing. We, you know, got the asset purchase stuff uh, done. We were, as you can imagine, extremely organized because we gave the company away, integrated it fully, and then reintegrated, took it back and reintegrated to ourselves. So it was like from a domain, email, documentation, code, like we are extremely organized and set up. And yeah, we transferred that over. We got the cash in the bank, always the best feeling. And uh, to be honest, we're still consulting with them, which is something that people don't always talk about with acquisitions is the follow-up post-acquisition. There's all the stuff you do, but typically you do get a consulting arrangement with these companies, um, which happened in both cases. Um, yeah. That, yeah. Yeah. Very, it's very typical to have some sort of, if you're, if you're, if you're selling a business at minimum, I would expect yeah. 90 day transition plan or consulting agreement. And you can get totally. paid for that too. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And the best part, there's two things that you said that I, I really, really like, and I want to touch on is number one, I like how you kept in touch with um, other buyers that you had spoken to. So if you yeah. sell on acquire.com and, and you sign a letter of intent, but you have other offers, it's so important or, or maybe not important, but um, it's just such a, a good move of character to go back to every buyer that gave you an offer and just say, hey, thanks, yeah. I'm moving forward with this other buyer. If anything goes wrong, I'm, I'd be happy to reach out to you to let you know. Because you yeah. never know, you might sign the LOI and things just don't go correctly. And then yeah. if you have other buyers ready to go, um, it can also you know keep momentum on the deal towards closing because i always say if you have one buyer you have no buyers and it gets very fascinating and this is how you increase valuation or get better terms is you have multiple buyers because you have leverage you're able to say just like you said hey someone offered me this and yeah and it's proof it's proof of value right it's proof of social value like all the way through but yeah as i say this then like you know the stuff that you guys have created like has unlocked a whole area of liquidity and Hey, it's been a life changer for me, you know, like I'm on such a cool path now and have all the flexibility to build stuff, you know, and 
as a result of having access to that kind of pool of liquidity, which, you know, 10 years ago, like, doesn't work this way. Like, it wouldn't have worked that this way. So, hey, quite you, fortunate. You, you, you built the company and you sold it, man. Yeah. But I, I got a question. Um, so, it's, you know, it's closing day. The wire comes in, money hits a bank. What'd you do? Well, how, how'd you react right. to that, man? So, in, again, in, lucky enough, in, in both acquisitions, um, I made the same deal with my wife. I'm like, look, 80% reinvested, 20%, let's have some fun. So we went to Paris for a couple of weeks and then went to Hawaii um, and then came back and went back to business uh, with 80% of that now funneled into new ventures and uh, all the stuff that we need to do. Uh, made sure my team was taken care of and... Uh, at this point too, you know, after the first acquisition, uh, I was the sole sole owner of everything. So yeah, was able to, you know, make sure everything's everything's compensated nicely and excited and bonused out and now we go again. I love that. I have a rule that I always tell founders, depending on like the size of the acquisition or yeah. But but yes, don't spend it all. That's the rule number yeah, one. Exactly. But also if um you're unsure of, you know, where you want to invest it or whatever, maybe just let it sit in your bank account for six six months and just totally. cha change nothing about your lifestyle. Don't yeah. don't start, you know, yeah. angel investing and exactly. stuff like that. Totally. Just, just let it all kind of sink in. And then after yeah. six months, you know, you'll have a plan of maybe you want to start another business. Maybe you want to, you know, put it in the stock market. Maybe you and want to go. Equally whatever. important is to celebrate, you know, like you said, don't go buy like a bunch of diamonds or maybe you do, but you know, so celebrate like and enjoy that milestone that you've created for yourself because it's a big, it's a huge deal. It's a big deal. And it's easy sometimes as things happen to be like, okay, like now that was great. Like now what? But it's like, oh, just take a second. Right. And appreciate it. I agree with that too. When I um uh, when I sold my first SaaS business, um I bootstrapped it and sold it at when we reached around like ten million in recurring revenue. So it was a meaningful exit. And I yeah. just bought a thirty five thousand dollar um Mercedes AMG. Nice. It was like my my dream car. Um, but I bought it used. Okay. Um, yeah, you know, didn't buy like a of obnoxious course. car, but just a, a, a little sort of, yeah. you know, the promise give. you made to yourself as a uh, younger, younger uh, Andrew, you know, I, it was so I actually true story. I, I ran that my previous startup for eight years. And my call, I launched a business in college. And my college roommate was like, why are you always looking at like AMG Mercedes? <laughs> <laughs> and I was like, I don't know, like, it's what I, it's what I want. And then when I finally had the opportunity to get one, that's what I did. So nice. lo love that, man. Um, So there's a lot of, you know, startup founders, business owners listening to this and thinking, you know, man, I'd love to sell my business. If you had three pieces of advice to deliver to them, what do you think they'd be? Yeah, I mean, I think the first one and something we hear from yeah, a bunch of people that have sold stuff is like built to sell. You know, like if you think that you might want to sell, uh, then operate your business in that way, right? And that kind of means like put in, creating the package of things which keeps your business running smoothly, right? The documentation, the code, the approach to things, like don't just duct tape things together, like do it as if, you know, you were going to take over that because it only helps you with your acquisition case um, and helps your business stay organized, right? So if you're bundling things together and putting it right, it's good. And I've been on, I've, I've acquired some companies now and I've been the acquired company. And I can tell you that, you know, I hope that in my acquisitions, it was a dream for me to work. I, I was a dream to work with because I was like, okay, like here's everything. And, you know, you're the domain expert of, of your stuff, right? So I think that's, that's the main one. Um, and the second is like, know the market, right? Like understand where valuations are at, understand what you should be asking, because oftentimes the person, especially these days, the person acquiring your business might not necessarily be, you know, this like SaaS founder or something who's like, you have a chance, you do have a chance to benchmark and dictate yourself, right? In your terms, right? So, you know, markets are hot, you know, where things are at, like make that pitch, right? And, and translate that, right? And I think if you do that effectively, then you obviously can take as much value out of that. So I think those are like my top two, but definitely the organization one is the is the most important. Um, don't have a third one off the top of my head, but I, I guess celebrate. <laughs> yeah, I mean, there's there's one right there. Oh, sorry, the third one is it is never over until the money is in the bank. Like, yes. And <laughs> just to give you a good example, the first acquisition, like three days before closing, they're like, oh, we need to do like a lien check on the business. I'm like, great, got I don't want Google Cloud and five hundred dollar credit card, right? And anyways, they do they do a check. It turns out that our uh, the bank that we had our credit card from, in order to just give a credit card, they take a lien on the entire business, um, just as a blanket as a blanket lien, like that's their standard procedure. So now I had to we actually had to push the acquisition almost a month and a half forward, two months because I had to call the bank and get to the deep dark recesses of the corporate Toronto oh Tower. 
dealt with lien removals on credit cards for small businesses. Oh, and I had to keep the business open while closing down a credit card to remove the lien, which went to like some other government organization. And I was stressed out for like a month. I'm like, had RBC on speed dial being like, can I get this $500, this lien removed on this $500 card? That almost, that almost stopped the entire acquisition. Like literally, like it was that, actually, that is so wild. it's never over. Um, yeah, <laughs> I, I see that a out. lot with, with acquisitions that we work with, you know, it, it yeah. yeah last point it's not over until the money hits the bank so yeah continue, that's actually point uh, number one yeah so to build on that um i'll start with your first one because i agree with all of them preparation preparation is so critical for like i cannot stress this enough like have your financials together have a list of common due diligence questions create a transition guide make it easy for the buyer to wrap their head around their your business yeah. because most buyers are looking at typically i always say 100 deals Per day and yeah. startup founders don't realize that like and to look at your business and to go through your docs or to actually have a conversation with you is yeah. a big time commitment comparative to the other 99 startups are going to look at that day totally and then on your second point in terms of valuation this is a big one this is probably the number one reason why i see a lot of startups not selling is yeah. they read about some company that sold for 10 times revenue and that the biggest thing that, man that happens but that, that's an outlier that's not the averages and that's normal yeah. um and then also understanding who is going to buy your business i would totally. say Totally. You have a 45% chance of getting acquired by private equity, 5% strategic, and then 50%, it's probably going to be an individual buyer. Yeah. Google's not dying to buy, you know, um, yeah. you know, a subscale SaaS business. Um, you know, they, they typically strategics, you know, they aren't actively buying companies as much as private equity and individual buyers. So yeah. treat all buyers like the buyers, like they are the buyer until they are not. You can follow up all the way until you're blue in the face until you get a note, just like you're in sales. Yeah. And then yeah, exactly like you got to run it that way. Like it, it, it's a marketing exercise at the end of the day. And just even following up with the 40 people that reached out with an LOI, it's like, it takes like, I'm sure so many deals died just because people were like, oh, I can't deal with all these emails. You know what I mean? But you got it. Like You have to sell your business. You have to get on calls yeah. with buyers. You have to be transparent, honest. You have to be prepared. You have to have realistic asking price. Otherwise, buyers just aren't even going to give you a, yeah. a look at any of your details or any and you gotta play the you got to play the game too. You know, you got to keep people intrigued. Don't give everything as well. Like right up you know, out of the door, like you got, you got to play that game, right? Make it a little bit exclusive, make it like, like any sales thing, right? It's like, I don't know, I don't know the best way to say that, but there's a game to everything, right? Yeah. One, one tip there that we, um, uh, utilize is after the first call, if it goes well, have a separate data room set up with a bit more information mm -hmm. and then you give access to that data room Good and idea. then when you're on the call ask if they want to have a secondary call same time next week i call it book a meeting from a meeting so yeah. do not let the buyer off the call if you feel the call went well and they're, yeah. you know they're showing some sign of interest be like hey do you want to just kind of catch up next week totally i'll give you access yeah. to you know a data room with a little bit more information and this is assuming you're under nda um, but when you get on the calendar the next week, it keeps them accountable to go through the information. Yeah. And then at the yeah. worst case scenario, they say, Hey, we're not interested, but at least you keep momentum. Absolutely. And then when you sign an LOI, absolutely have a follow-up call every single week until the deal closes. I don't yeah. care if you talk about the weather or your favorite sports team that lost, whatever or some really big issue, but constant yeah. communication, because that's where a lot of deals die too, is just you, the momentum starts to slow and you know, like something, a surprise comes up. You want to address those things as quickly as possible. So um, another another tip there. Um, yeah, and also, okay. yeah, that, that's fine. <laughs> I was gonna say, I mean, just uh, that alone was just like, yeah, like, you know, things like asset purchase agreements, if they make sense for you, are so much easier to do, right? So you make things easy for both parties. Yeah, legal counsel, always there to help. Or yeah. com, we we got a asset purchase agreement builder, totally. letter of intent builder. Um, sorry, sorry, shameless plug on my own podcast. No, 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 no. That's that's <laughs> what it's referring. That's what it's referring to. So, <laughs> so Q, um, you've gone through, uh, you know, several successful exits now. Um, I gotta assume you got something new you're working on. What's what's next for you? 
Yeah. So the outcome of the acquisitions today has sort of been the formation of like my own holding company called New Ventures, NUU, which is sort of a nickname my brother used to call me. And sort of within there, we're um, buying some SaaS businesses, we're building. Nice. Bunch, Where are you going to buy them? We are buying some from acquire.com. Uh, we've purchased a few others just through cold outreach for just one for my friend the other day, but we're basically buying traffic. So we're building niche sites and we're buying products to fit with these niche sites. I would tell the niche sites, but the first rule with niche sites is don't tell people what your niche site is. Um, so yeah, so I've made four acquisitions this year, uh, which has been exciting. And it's nice to get acquired for 10 to 15x and acquire for, you know, 2x if you can. <laughs> <laughs> and wow. uh, got their spread there. And so, yeah, so we're building stuff, we're building traffic, and now I get to play the long-term three to five-year uh, game as opposed to the six-month, uh, you know, watching the burn in my bank account go. And so, yeah, we're doing stuff in the freelancer space, the remote work space, SaaS, and then carbon and finance. And so uh, we have a team now where we can kind of push everything together and uh, we kind of operate like a venture studio, which is kind of exciting. Love it. Well, Q, I'm, I'm, I'm rooting for you, man. If, uh, if you want to learn uh, more about you or just just reach out to you. Where can they find you online? Uh, you can find me on Twitter at Kiyum Rajan. Um, yep, I'm always around there. So just DM All me right. and I'm um, super responsive. We'll put that in the show notes. Hopefully you don't get too many people reaching out. But um, congrats again on the acquisition, man. And uh, hopefully Thanks. I see you back here selling, you know, seven, eight figure acquisition. That is the goal. So hopefully. All right, man. Great chat. All right. Take care. Cheers.